Good evening. Today I'll be uh, spending the next few minutes talking about nuclear power in space. Uh, looking basically at the small nuclear reactors which will be small enough to take on launch vehicles to Mars, to the Moon, so that uh, people who are inhabited over there would be able to get electricity. Now, <clears throat> I'll talk first of all about the status of nuclear power. At the moment, there are 448 reactors in the world, providing between 12 to 15 percent of the global electricity. These are the figures of the last two to three years. <clears throat> Uh, if you look at the development of nuclear power technology, you could say that the first generation of nuclear power plants was in the 1960s with prototypes and early day reactors, which were light water reactors, the pressurized water reactor, the boiling water reactor, gas cool reactors, and the Canadian deuterium uranium natural uranium reactor. These went into the 70s where then uh, advanced light water reactors were designed and we saw the AP-1000 and the EPR. Now looking ahead, so these were the generation 3 and generation 3 plus reactors. Looking ahead the next 10 years, we will enter the fourth generation of nuclear reactors. And uh, the generation 4 international forum, which has 13 member states at the moment, is looking at six possible designs. The gas cooled fast reactor, the lead cooled fast reactor, the very high temperature reactor, the supercritical water reactor, the molten salt reactor, and the sodium uh, cooled fast reactor. Just to give you some idea, the standard these days are of course big nuclear power plants. By big, I mean 1000 megawatt electric, the average in the world right now is close to about 8, 850 megawatt electric. Because of economies of scale, uh, the first, second, third generation reactors went for large size. <clears throat> so a typical pressurized water reactor, 1000 megawatt electric, would be using uranium dioxide fuel, 3 to 5 percent enriched, with over, over about 150 assemblies, each assembly weighing about 655 kg with uh, uranium and zircon oil. The system would be water steam, so thermal nuclear energy would be converted into uh, steam. Steam would drive a turbine, so convert into mechanical energy. Mechanical energy would be converted into electrical energy through a generator. If you look at one of these reactors, the sodium cooled fast reactor like the 4S, which is for smaller power, 10 to 50 megawatt electric. So this would have 17 to 19 percent enriched uranium and U10 zircaloy fuel. The 4S design is a small, super safe and simple reactor for a 30 year hands-free maintenance. It has 6 plus 12 assemblies with 1.7 tons of U235 cooled by liquid sodium with electromagnetic pumps reflected by a movable beryllium reflector. The micronuclear reactors which are being worked on these days are in the range of 1 to 2 megawatt thermal based on uranium, nitride 70% fuel and with the core only about 30 centimeter in dire cylinder with 40 centimeter height. Now these uh, new micronuclear reactors will use uh, uh, heat pipes, thermoelectric generators, and beryllium or beryllium oxide reflectors. The fuel plus reflector weight is as low as 310 kg. <clears throat> so of course this you could not carry with you. This also you could not carry, but now we come to 300 kg which can be transported. Yet smaller uh, reactors are being designed at Los Alamos, uh, National Labs, NASA, with NASA, <clears throat> the Krusty, the kilopower reactor using Stirling technology, has a highly enriched uranium 93% enriched for a very small power of 5 kilowatt thermal with about 15 to 20% conversion efficiency. So you could produce maybe 1 kilowatt electric. And 
it uh, has fuel 28 kg U235 with beryllium reflector, <coughs> sterling engine and heat pipe. Okay, so now let's look at the applications of uh, SMRs and micronuclear reactors. Now small modular reactors would have a place in off-grid uh, <coughs> off areas where they would support the base load from big nuclear power plants and they would be moderate enough so that if you added a 50 megawatt unit you could have six more of those you could transport them from the factory and you could produce 300 megawatt. So there seems to be a lot of uh, future for SMRs. If you come down in uh, size to the micronuclear reactors, then we see that there is a scope in space, submarines and defense establishments. Now, if you look at space, basically our questions have been, is there life in the solar system? Is there any water on any other planet? Can any other planets support life? Are there any signs of microbial existence? And what kind of information does the soil of other planets have in it from which we can infer that was there ever life over there? So basically, the human question is, who are we? Where did we come from? Could we have come from Mars? Could we have left Mars because we started fighting with each other, because there was uh, global warming, because there was too much pollution, was it overpopulated? Could that have happened? So let's take a look at space. Now, this is what we know that if you're looking at the, from the north axis of the Earth, everything is moving counterclockwise. The sun is and so are the planets in elliptical orbits, each with eccentricity. So now here is our Earth. The closer you look at planets, closer to the sun, faster they move. We are moving at about, uh, I think, more than 12,000 kilometers per hour. In our orbit, we have, a, we have a year of 365 days. Mars is uh, more than 680 days. And, uh, but Mars moves slower than Earth. So Earth is moving at about 30 kilometers per second. Mars is moving at 24 kilometers per second. We are also spinning about our axis about half a kilometer per second. So actually we are on a very fast moving spaceship ourselves. So this is how we are moving. If you look at the distance of Earth from the Sun is 150 million kilometers. Distance of Mars from Sun is 225 million kilometers. And if you look at our own moon, that's on the average about 384,000 kilometers. So when we say it's a full moon, a super moon, that means it's come about 40,000 kilometers closer, so it looks bigger. So now, if you look at the relative sizes, the diameter of the Earth is about twice the diameter of uh, Mars, and Mars is about twice the diameter of the Moon. So these are places where we can start looking for uh, information on our own solar system. Now, if you look at the past, uh, I remember the first artificial satellite was 4th of October, 1957. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Russian Sputnik, and then we had Apollo in the 60s, then uh, so USSR and USA uh, were leading the rush to the moon, the race to the moon, then came of course uh, European Space Agency, Japan, China and India. India in 2019 made an attempt to land on the dark side of the moon, they almost got there but then they lost communication and they could not land. If you look at Mars, then NASA from the USA and uh, USSR and uh, China and the European Space Agency and India have uh, sent uh, spacecraft, India for example in 2013, and uh, NASA spent the, sent a number of missions to Mars. The uh, previous one was 2011 where Curiosity rover is still over there and for the last so many years it's been moving and giving us information on the pictures, it's taking soil, it's doing a lot of analysis, it's got extra fluorescence, lots of instrumentation. 
and it has its own power source. So we are interested in what kind of a power source does it have. So I'll come to discuss that. I'll just come back because um, I would like to show you the relevance of nuclear power specifically to how we can help in space propulsion and for sustaining life on Mars if that becomes a possibility in the future. Now this year NASA is planning another mission to Mars uh, between July and August and the spacecraft that will be sent is called Perseverance. Uh, Perseverance is uh, an upgrade of the previous uh, rover and uh, I'll just go into the details of uh, how you get from Earth to Mars, how long does it take and what kind of a trajectory do you have to take. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's come to uh, how you get from Earth to Mars. Now this is the uh, Mars Orbiter mission of the Indian Space Research Organization which on the 1st December 2013 uh, on the PSLV, the launch vehicle, they launched the spacecraft along this trajectory as you can see over here. So basically it's a slingshot which goes further and further away until it develops uh, enough energy to escape from the pull of the Earth and by about 600,000 kilometers in its trajectory, the Earth's gravitational field is too weak to pull it, so it becomes free and there are perturbations of the Sun's <coughs> gravitational field on that. So it goes all the way until, so by the time Mars reaches over here, then you have orbit insertion which in India's case took about 10 months. The closest distance between Earth and Mars is about 56 million kilometers. And uh, once this was achieved over here, then the uh, spacecraft opened its solar panels. It's got three solar panels. It weighs about 1,200 kilograms approximately. Please check the website. It's got a, a propulsion unit. It's got antennas to send information. The uh, Indian uh, Space Research Organization uh, states a cost of $70 million, which is uh, very, very uh, low compared with uh, other budgets. And uh, this has a five-year design life and a 15 kilogram payload. Now, the point that is the focus of this talk is how do you power the spacecraft like uh, uh, presently you've got Curiosity and this year you'll have Perseverance. So these are rovers, they're like cars, they have lots and lots of instrumentation, they have robotic arms, they do digging over there, they do uh, lots of data gathering, lots of data processing, lots of communication over there, so they need a lot of power. Now the present rover and even the past NASA missions were relying on radioisotope thermal generators which uh, essentially run on the thermal heat from plutonium-238 which is produced by the neutron capture of neptunium-237 which becomes 238 and beta decays uh, with 2.12 days to come to plutonium-238. Now the half-life of this alpha emitter is about 87.7 years so it's, it's good. The activity of 1 gram, which is lambda n, is about 634 times 10 to 9 becquerels, which comes to about 0 0.6 watts. So, this is the power system of Curiosity, which gives them about 100 watt electric. Now, this is a very small unit of, this is a very small amount of power. So, how do you increase power if human beings ever go there, if you want to have a little space colony? So the answer to that is what I was telling you, <clears throat> the micro-nuclear reactor, which is uh, presently being worked on in a number of countries. This is based on advanced uranium nitride fuel, 13.6 gram per cubic centimeter density, heat pipes with either lithium or potassium or sodium, but lithium can do better, it can operate at higher temperatures. The matrix, as you can see, this is a monolith with molybdenum 14 Re, which has a melting point of about 3200 degrees C in excess of that. The rotating control rods 
uh, in the reflector, which is beryllium oxide. And uh, they are tipped with B4C, boron carbide. The total weight of this uh, fuel plus reflector is 310 kg. So essentially the heat carried by the heat pipes goes up directly to the thermoelectric generator. There is no, there are no pumps over here, there is no turbine. So it's a, it's a very uh, straightforward procedure which is good for space missions. Now, it's a good technology and if you can get uh, 15, 10 to 15% or even 5% of 2 megawatt, then you can go as high as 100 kilowatt electric. So this is the latest technology it needs to be developed and this provides great potential and uh, the future of nuclear engineering, the, the new age for nuclear engineering is SMRs, generation 4 reactors and very small micronuclear reactors of this sort. Uh, this is what we need to now do further research in. This is a very uh, challenging topic because of new materials, because of new technologies of heat removal, because of the development of new fuels and because of studying that is it a safe system. Now this I, I should mention this is 70% highly enriched uranium. So there are issues which still need to be resolved but basically I would end by saying that this is a technology that needs to be developed. I hope I have given you a good introduction to how nuclear power could be useful for space applications. Thank you.